Hi, everybody. Welcome to week 12 of cell and molecular biology. This week, we're discussing the cytoskeleton. So originally, this would have been at least two lectures. Um, so it's a, a lot of material all at once, but that's OK. You guys have got this. Um, so without further ado, let's get into our agenda for today. OK, so there are three types of proteins or filaments that make up the cytoskeleton in our cells. Um, and with those different types comes lots of accessory proteins, things that interact with them, bundle them together, et cetera. Um, and importantly, there's also a few motor proteins that we'll talk about today that associate with these different types of proteins. Um, and then we'll spend quite a bit of time on muscle movement, which is directed by these different motor proteins and filaments. But before we get into the content for today, I just want to go over a couple of announcements. Um, so again, thanks for your patience for getting this up this week for whatever reason has been quite a week. Um, I don't know about you guys. OK, but thinking ahead to the rest of the semester, I know you guys are anxious for more information on your literature presentations. So you will have drafts of your slide and your talking points to do. That will be the same thing as um, what has what was discussed in the assignment, um, but more details will be forthcoming for um, like rubrics and things. Um, but just so that you guys know and can put it in your calendar, uh, we're going to have the drafts due week 14. Okay, so two weeks from this Sunday. So Sunday, April 19th is when both of those things will be due, and there will be specific places in Moodle where you guys will upload those. Okay, so those drafts will be due the week before the final presentations are due. So what I'll have you guys do is um, submit your final slides. And then instead of uh, presenting in class, you will just film yourself giving this presentation. Um, so it's kind of an awkward format. You don't need to have your slides visible in this presentation. But it will help me um, as I'm going through if you say next slide or if you refer to them by number or some other indication that you guys can give me um, to tell me what slide you're currently talking about. Um, and all, so that the final information, the final slides, and your filmed presentation will be due week 15. So the, the final week that we would have had in-person classes so Sunday, April 26th. And so this is also fulfill that speaking extensive requirement for this course. There is an associated rubric that will go along with these. Um, and I'll, I'll do my best to get that up very soon. OK, so again, any, any questions about this, let me know. I will be reposting more information and, and giving you guys more, more details as we go forward. But just so that you know what to expect, um, we have a few more weeks to work on this. Um, in addition to the speaking extensive requirement, there's also a global awareness blueprint requirement. Um, these requirements are a little bit nebulous, um, but just so that we can fulfill this idea, um, we're going to reflect on an incident called the SAP incident. This happened a few years ago now, um, but this is a case study in the cultural context of biomedical research ethics. So there was a, a paper that came out of a group in Japan that uh, said they were able to induce stem cells from um, a pH bath rather than all of the other extensive protocols that people had been using. Um, and there was a huge fallout of this incident after it was um, put forward that the person in charge of this paper um, wasn't doing it in a completely ethical way. So it's a really cool incident in the, the history of cell biology. And it also takes into account um, the differences in research ethics in Japan and their culture versus in the US and other countries. Um, so more details coming soon. I'm converting it from what would have been a multi-day uh, multi um, discussion-based activity into more of an individual assignment. So finishing that up here, more details very soon. 
And then a lab of some sort will be available this week. Um, it will have to do with CRISPR in some way. There may or may not be, may or may not be one or more options. Um, still finalizing the details on that. And by the end of today, you will have something more for our lab. Okay, so you'll get another couple emails from me once I update things and put things on Moodle. Um, so I, if there's information you don't have and you think you should, email me. Otherwise, it will be coming soon. So again, thanks for your patience as we're making this transition. Okay, so that's all I have for announcements. Now we can get to our content. So the cytoskeleton. This is a topic that's really fascinating. So a lot of diagrams we see of cells and textbooks and things leave out a lot of these molecules, um, but they're pretty integral in keeping the cell in its shape and contributes to movement and all kinds of really important processes. So we're going to uncover some mysteries of the cytoskeleton today. Okay, so there's those three main components or filaments that I mentioned at the beginning in our agenda. One big group is called microtubules, and so these are kind of named based on their size. Um, so microtubules, pretty small. They're made of these individual um, proteins, individual polymers called tubulin, and each molecule of tubulin is a heterodimer of these two alpha-beta subunits. So we'll get into the details of that in the next few slides. We also have microfilaments. Um, these are also called actin, if you've heard of actin before. These ones are pretty small, extensive throughout the cell, and these are made of monomers called actin. Okay, so we've seen lots of globular proteins throughout the semester. These are going to be more um, structural and more filamentous. And then we have our intermediate filaments. So these are an intermediate size um, between uh, a couple different ones. These are just named based on their size when people discovered them. Um, and these are structural in nature, so another kind of tubular shape made of dimers of proteins. Okay, so these are our three different types, microtubules, microfilaments, or actin, and intermediate filaments. So we're going to start with information on intermediate filaments. So there's kind of two main flavors. Um, there are lots of them in the cytoplasm, and there are very specific kinds that are in the nucleus. And so the ones that are in the nucleus are called nuclear lamins. Those contribute to the, the structure of the nucleus. And then there's a few different um, types of cytoplasmic filaments. One of the biggest groups is keratin. This is found in a lot of epithelial cells. It contributes to our nails and hair. Um, so if you rub your, your fingernails together, those are structured due to keratin. And then lots of other, other skin cells and epithelial cells. There's also these vimentin and vimentin-related filaments. These are in uh, connective-type tissues, muscle, glia, those kinds of things. And then a specific flavor of cytoplasmic intermediate filaments are found in nerve cells. So this is just kind of a global overview of different kinds. So more details on um, the individual components. So the smallest unit of an intermediate filament is this dimer of two proteins. So the N-terminal region and the C-terminal region have kind of little bitty globular bits, and then these are alpha helices wound around each other. So each um, individual end can associate with another protein, and so these make um, tetramers with each other, and they can, so they can bind kind of side to side and also end to end. So these groups of tetramers then can come together and make up protofilaments, or kind of before filaments. And then these filaments then can interact with each other and contribute to this big, long structure. So intermediate filaments are really important for cells because um, it helps protect the cell against mechanical stress. So these are very much structural in nature. These help the cell keep its shape 
if you have mutations in genes that code for these proteins, you can get some really um, devastating diseases, conditions where your skin cells can't stay together. Um, it's a pretty tough disease. Um, there is also no directionality to this group. So this is in contrast with the next two groups of filaments we'll look at. Um, each end is kind of is the exact same of each other since they're in this anti-parallel structure. All right, so we have our N group here and our C group right here. Um, so these are forming tetramers almost like DNA strands, they're running anti-parallel. So there's no difference between this end of this uh, tetramer versus this end. Um, so there's no polarity to these. So either end of this filament is the same. And again, that's different compared to the two we'll see in a few. Um, and so these are also only contributing to the structure of cells. They're not involved in cell movement in one way or another. And again, that's in contrast to the next types of um, cytoskeleton proteins. And then just as a reminder, there's these four different classes. Um, keratin is the biggest and most diverse family, um, the components of our, our skin cells, fingernails, and rhino horns. So actually, if you look at the structure of uh, the horn of a rhinoceros, it's mostly keratin. Okay, so these are intermediate filaments in a nutshell. One of those um, important groups was in the nucleus. And so we've already kind of broken down the structure of the nucleus, right? We've looked at the structure of nuclear pores when we talked about protein movement. Um, there's this nuclear lamina. Those are these blue thread structures right here. And these are made of intermediate filaments and kind of other proteins that provide structure to the nuclear envelope. So those intermediate filaments make up the nuclear lamina, and they support the structure of the nucleus. So it almost looks like a, a mesh or a web underneath that membrane. Okay, so that's all for intermediate filaments. Now we're going to talk about another big group called microtubules. These are really cool structural proteins um, that have very specific shapes and contribute to cell movement as well as structure. Um, so one of the biggest jobs that microtubules play in the cell is transporting and positioning membrane-bound organelles. So why the ER is spread out where it is, why the Golgi is where it is, all that is driven by um, movement along these microtubules. Uh, when we're thinking about the structure, they're basically hollow tubes composed of tubulin. And again, tubuli tubulin is a molecule that is a heterodimer, which means the alpha and beta subunits are different, um, a heterodimer of these alpha beta subunits. So all of these individual tubulin molecules will link up to each other to make a protofilament. And in contrast to our intermediate filaments, these do have polarity. So if the alpha protein is exposed, that's our minus end. And if the beta protein is exposed here at the end, that's our plus end. And so there's going to be different types of behaviors at either end, which we'll explore in a few. Uh, so in any case, end to end, these line up into a protofilament. Uh, but in order to make a hollow tube, we need multiple protofilaments. And if you count around the edge, you'll see that 13 of these protofilaments make up one microtubule. So you can see in this electron micrograph kind of a cross section of one of these things. Each one of these lighter regions is one of those protofilaments. And if you look along the transverse side, you can see um, the structure of those uh, tubulin molecules. OK, so the polarity is important. Um, especially in relation to how things move in the cell. So some motor proteins are going to move in one direction or another. So maintaining this polarity is really important. Um, and besides just having one end that's different than the other, uh, these structures actually undergo almost constant 
or at least at any time could undergo either assembly, so building up, um, or disassembly or breaking down of these tubules. So rather than building something and leaving it there, these are always uh, in flux and changing, which is really important for it to function throughout the cell. So constantly shifting between assembly and disassembly. And we'll see the different ways that this is regulated. So really cool molecules. Okay, so kind of connecting uh, what they do and where they are in the cell to their functions and uh, what direction they're facing. So if we look at a nerve cell, microtubules are really important um, for vesicle transportation, right? So we need those signals to go through. We need to bring those vesicles of um, neurotransmitters through. And so we have our plus polarity here down the axon. Dendritic cells can move things in either direction. Um, but most of the transportation is boom, going to be down this axon. Um, in addition to nerve cells, microtubules play a really big role in certain structures um, like cilia or villi. Um, so in this cell with a bunch of cilia on the end, these microtubules are built up and the positive ends are on the outside. The negative ends are here. So I'll just pause and mention um, a centrosome or a basal body, they're kind of similar structures. So our centrosome right here um, in cells, more often than not located right next to the nucleus. So MTOC just means microtubule organizing center. And so part of building a microtubule um, is that it's really hard to start one from scratch it's way easier to kind of anchor one in place and build from the positive end. And so often microtubules are anchored into a centrosome, which has these centrioles in the middle. These are their own kind of special microtubules. Um, but in any case, there's a way to kind of get these started so we can just build off of these MTOCs. So in the cell, if it's near the nucleus, it's called a, a centrosome. There's a special case if we have cells with cilia over here. Um, they also have these little centrioles, um, but in this case, they're called basal bodies. And basal bodies are, have the same function. They're just places where microtubules can be built off of. Okay, and again, there's polarity. So our plus ends are out here, our minus ends are closer to the, the basal body or the centrosome. We can also arrange them in a way that's outside on the margin. Um, and in this case, there's a mix of polarities here. So in this red blood cell, it's providing structure on the outside. Um, and then once Whatever cell needs to divide, of course, these play microtubules play in a really important role in uh, mitosis and cell division. So our centrosome, where most of these microtubules are growing out of, then will um, split and go to either end of the cell. And so this then will allow for our chromosomes to be separated um, during anaphase. And so microtubules are really important for connecting to the chromosomes, and then motor proteins then will help pull these chromosomes toward either end of the cell. Okay, so microtubules in a nutshell contribute to kind of the backbone structures of a lot of things. They're built off of centrosomes or basal bodies, and we'll see some more information on the building up and breaking down of those in the next few slides. Okay, so our good old friend GTP is important for this process of building up and breaking down microtubules. So these aren't just uh, molecules of tubulin by themselves. More often than not, they're bound to either GDP or GTP. And the concentration of tubulin just around in the cell also contributes to whether or not we're building up or breaking down microtubulin. Uh, so if we're building or growing a microtubule, often there's going to be a lot 
of tubulin lying around the cell. Uh, these are bound to GTP when they're monomers. And if we're building a lot of GT of um, if we're building our our microtubule, we're adding lots of tubulin all at once. Um, the positive end then is going to have a lot of tubulin with GTP bound. And this process is going to happen. So we're going to be able to add tubulin faster than we're going to be able to turn GTP into GDP. So the addition of tubulin is faster than we can hydrolyze GTP. And so that, when this happens, we have a GTP cap. And this is significant. Why it's called a cap is it has a little bit of a protective nature. So the tubulin molecules that have GTP bound uh, mean that they're more packed together. They're more likely to stay together. Once you rip off that, um, once you hydrolyze GTP and you have GDP bound, um, those molecules are less likely to stick around. And they're more able to dissociate. So if we're adding tubulin very fast, we have lots of GTP bound tubulin. It's going to form this GTP cap. Okay, so lots of tubulin. We're building it. It's going to form this cap and protect it from breaking down. But there are cases where we do want to break down tubulin. Um, and so we just let that, we just hydrolyze those GTP molecules. We don't have that cap anymore. Um, again, those molecules with GDP bound are going to um, be more likely to pull away. And so we just let that process go, and these will dissociate and, and come apart. So there's different proteins that regulate these different processes. We definitely want to be able to switch between these. Um, there's other things that might be able to anchor this in addition to the GTP cap. But essentially, um, microtubules are able to switch from building up and breaking down. And it has to do with GTP hydrolysis. All right, so another word for that breaking down of tubulin is called catastrophe, which is uh, more creative than we often see in terms of naming conventions. Um, but when there's a low tubulin concentration, again, it's going to be GTPs will be hydrolyzed, we don't have that GTP cap, and will lead to a catastrophe or that breaking down. And so different concentrations of tubulin um, in different places will help uh, regulate that process. And so here's some more um, details on centriole structure. So that centrosome, again, has these pairs of centrioles in the middle. These are a different kind of microtubules um, that sit in the middle. It's a little unclear what their role is actually um, in this process. Um, but outside of these, there is a matrix around these centrioles. And these little red rings that you see on the outside are a different kind of tubulin called gamma tubulin. So this makes a little ring structure in the matrix of the centrosome. And this allows those microtubules to kind of anchor in place and build off from there. So again, it's, it's more difficult to just start with some tubulin and make a full um, microtubule because they're made of those 13 protofilaments. So if you have a place where you can anchor them in somewhere, um, then they're able to be built out. And so that's the function of these of these centrioles or these microtubule organizing centers. And so when we have them uh, arranged this way, then their positive ends are coming out of the centriole of the centrosome, and their negative ends are located um, interacting with this gamma tubulin. And so in the image on the very right we see um, a, a rendition of the molecules in, oh, what is it, a C. elegans cell. So this is an image from your book. Um, this is a really cool rendition. You can see those centrioles right here. The gamma tubulin is in red. 
and then all these beautiful green microtubules are protruding out further. Okay, so we also talked about movement in the cell. So microtubules are connecting lots of different pieces. They're able to go from those um, centrosomes out through the rest of the cell. And so there are specific proteins then that will interact with these microtubules and move things along. So vesicles, we, we saw a, um, a look at how they're moved with signaling proteins. Um, and the way they're able to get from one place to another is that they're anchored to these motor proteins. So we're going to talk about two different flavors on this slide. So this one on the top is called kinesin. And this one on the bottom is called dynine. So you can see there's some similarities and some differences between these two molecules. So kinesin is this really amazing um, molecule. It has two globular proteins right here that interact with the tubule. And then on the other end, after we have this alpha helical chain, is a, able to interact with a vesicle or an organelle um, or whatever it needs to move. So kinesins are always going to move toward the positive end of a microtubule. So if you put one on close to the centrosome, it's going to walk itself out along the cell. And this process is driven by ATP. So these little globular proteins right here are ATP aces. So these will only function in the presence of ATP. Um, and it, it's able to walk. It looks like it's walking since it has these two structures. Um, but it will just kind of bounce around um, on this microtubule. And each time it interacts with the microtubule, it'll hydrolyze an ATP. And that allows this next foot to come down, hydrolyzes an ATP, and each ATP molecule allows it to move farther along the microtubule. Okay, so similar to kinesin, dynein also has these two globular proteins that rely on ATP to move. But in this case, they're always going to move toward the minus end of the microtubule. So this is important, right? We don't want one molecule that can only go in one direction because we need to be able to move things all throughout the cell. So if a vesicle is attached to kinesin, it will walk outwards. When a vesicle is attached to dynein, it will uh, march itself toward the, the minus end. And this is a really amazing image of a vesicle being moved along a microtubule. Um, if you care to search, there are really awesome movies of kinesin walking along a microtubule. Um, so I have a link to one video a little bit later, but those are always neat to see um, how we can model their movement. And so this is from the section, the how we know section in your textbook. Um, people are able to look at and kind of unpack how these kinesins are able to move along. And so in, in image A right here, they've labeled the kinesin or the vesicle a certain color. The microtubule in this case is green. And we can see that these are actually moving along here from one time point to the other. And from this um, direct data, scientists are able then to model how these proteins are moving along. So again, we have these globular ATP aces. These interact directly with the, the tubulin molecules. And every time you hydrolyze an ATP, this spec foot, we'll call it, is going to be able to um, dissociate and then interact again. And then this other foot is able to hydrolyze ATP. And just one step in front of the other is what allows these proteins to move vesicles and other things. So in addition to vesicles, um, just in the cell in general, specifically in nerve cells, it's really important to move these back and forth, right? So along the axon, our red um, kinesin molecules are able to move things along toward the positive ends of these microtubules out here to get to that axon terminal. 
that these neurotransmitters can be released. And then our dynein molecules and other similar ones can then bring things back along the axon. So it's not just vesicles that move around the cell, it's also whole organelles. Um, so when a cell is growing, it needs to be able to stretch out the ER. Um, so the, the organization where certain organelles in the cell are all thanks to the microtubules and those motor proteins. So here's our organizing center. We're able to bring and kind of anchor different organelles in different, in different spots. So kinesins are able to bring things from the ER into the Golgi. And then both kinesins and dynines are able to move things from different organelles to the other. So a really sophisticated system for moving things around the cell not often depicted in pictures of cells, but very important nonetheless. Um, so uh, the cell cycle and mitosis is also highly regulated by microtubules, and we'll talk about that a lot more next week when we talk about the cell cycle. Um, because a lot of these processes make more sense in motion, um, I highly recommend looking for videos of how these work. Um, and one I found in particular is a nice TED talk. So it's a little bit more broad in scope than our topic today. It's about nine and a half minutes long. Um, and the, there are some images of motor proteins that don't arrive until about minute seven. But it's a nice TED talk thinking about um, how we depict science and molecular biology and how it's much easier to show pictures and movies. So it's a nice little uh, break in instruction. I highly recommend you checking this video out. And if you really want to skip to the good parts, the motor proteins, you can skip to minute seven. Okay, so that's all for microtubule. Oh, just kidding. There's a little bit more. So um, in addition to moving organelles, we can also use microtubules to move the entire cell. So certain cells that rely on flagella, like these sperm cells, and certain cells that use cilia to move around um, are, being, are able to move because of the action of microtubules. So if you are a cell that has cilia on your surface, you are going to use them almost like oars if you've ever been in a canoe um, or some similar kind of watercraft. You're able to move that structure with those microtubules inside, um, do one big power stroke so you're going to be moving a lot of fluid around. So you'll have this really strong push. And then you'll have a much more gentle recovery. So that's what these dotted lines represent. So we've moved this big um, cilia over here. And then very slowly, we're just going to retract this filament, these, this structure, to the starting point. And so that's what's going to be able to let this cell move in a certain direction. So this combination of power strokes and then slower recoveries. So this would be dipping your oar into the water, pulling, and then lifting your oar back out of the water to, to put it in the same position. Okay, so when we look at how the microtubules within these are structured, there's actually a specific way the microtubules are arranged. So there's this pattern of nine pairs of microtubules on the outside and two that are in this connected double in the middle. And so I'm not worried about the, the details of this, but just to know that when we look we can do a cross-section of flagella and cilia. We can look in and see this very specific arrangement of microtubules and motor proteins. OK, so when we're thinking about how we're able to get these structures to bend, um, it's all due to how these microtubules are arranged in relation to their motor proteins. So we have two of our microtubules on the side. 
Remember, they're in this big structure, kind of in this big ring. So this is all happening in parallel. And we have our diamine molecules, and they're arranged in a certain way. So our, our uh, head groups right here are attached to one, and our tail groups of our diamine molecules are attached to another microtubule. These tubules are oriented in the same direction. And so dynein is only going to go toward one end. Right, so dynein always goes toward the minus end. So in isolation, so not in a functioning cell, we can look at this process. And if there's nothing else kind of anchoring any of these proteins anywhere, these dynein molecules are going to move toward the negative end, and that's going to push this microtubule up this way. All right, so in vitro, we just see this, this constant movement they're able to move sideways relative to each other, the microtubules are. But when we look at this in an actual cell, there are other proteins that connect these two microtubules. So looking over here at a small section of the sperm flagella, we have these um, proteins that link the two microtubules together. And those are able then to, um, instead of having those microtubules just shift along each other um, it creates a bending motion, and that's what allows the flagella to move and move the cell. So now that we've linked our two microtubules together, the dynein are still only going to go toward the minus end. This pushes this microtubule on the right upward toward the positive end, and because these are stuck together, it's going to cause this bending motion. And that's just a small snippet of how those flagella are able to move. So all thanks to the, the microtubule structure and those motor proteins moving them along. All right, and that is it for microtubules. Now we're going to move on to our last um, group of uh, pieces of the cytoskeleton, and those are our actin filaments, also called microfilaments. And these also contribute to really amazing structures in the cell. So we can make pseudopodia, this kind of structure right here, reaching out for something that the cell is going to ingest. It also allows um, pseudopodia to move. We're going to talk about different cells that move, um, aside from the examples we've already mentioned. And there are a couple structures called phylopodia and lamellopodia. And actin filaments can either help with movement or help with adhesion. And then they also help make these structures called microvilli. So in your gut, a lot of cells that lie in your um, epithelium have these microvilli, helps with absorption of nutrients. All right, so here's the more cartoon version of what we just saw. So these pink actin filaments are able to form together and make these different protrusions and projections. So they're found throughout the cell, um, contribute to these different structures. They also contribute to the contractile ring during cytokinesis. So these are proteins that help pinch those two halves of the cell apart to create two daughter cells. Okay, so some information on the structure of actin filaments or microfilaments. So just like the other examples, we have our monomers. In this case, they're called G-actin. It stands for globular actin. That just means they're single um, actin molecules. When they are in high enough concentration, they will start to dimerize. So they'll just, um, without energy required, start sticking together. Uh, based on non-covalent interactions. Um, to start an actin filament, you just need a group of three. It forms a trimer right here. And as we have this trimer, more of these G-actin are able to just expand on this group and form a full filament. And so just like microtubules, actin molecules have polarity. So it's also referred to as the plus or minus end, uh, but more specifically, we can call it the pointed end or the barbed end. And once we have enough monomers put together, we can call this S-actin. 
And that's when, that stands for filament actin. And so this is the cartoon version. Here is the molecular model of what this looks like. And so each of these are individual actin monomers. And again, the, the pointed end and the positive or the, the barbed end. They're shaped a little bit differently. And again, that polarity will help with movement. And here is kind of a um, ribbon diagram version of that pointed end. It has this projection at the back. And then at the barbed end, there's more of a um, concave section right here, all due to the structure of these proteins. OK, so similar to microtubules, microtubule um, move, or production, assembly and disassembly, was driven by GTP. Um, and actin is driven by ATP. And so very kind of similar idea. When the monomers have ADP bound, they're less likely to stick together, or they're more easily separated from each other. When there's ATP bound, they are more readily able to associate and stick together. And so if we have more actin filament or actin monomers around, they're added to the beginning faster than ATP is hydrolyzed, which stabilizes this end. Um, but as ATP is hydrolyzed, then we have the pointed end with ADP bound, and it's easier for these to, to come off. Um, so it's called treadmilling because even though we're adding more to the, the front, some are being dissociated from the back. So it's this constant motion even though we're not really going anywhere. And so this process is really critical for the structure and the function. Um, so again, this isn't a static structure. This is constantly being added to and taken away. Um, and this movement, this process of building up and breaking down contributes to how it works in the cell. And so here's an, exam an example of different orientations for these things. Again, um, it has a polarity, that pointed and barbed end. So this whole structure is a cartoon macrophage, one of the many kinds of cells that move around in our bodies. And having actin uh, with a direction one way or the other is really important for movement. So when we're thinking of um, needing to contract, there are these different stress fibers that help with that process. <clears throat> In the cell cortex itself, so what's um, kind of helping membranes stay in place, the polarity is all over the place. It's just this mesh gel structure. Um, but then if we're thinking about how cells are moving in the direction that these are moving ahead, it's called the leading edge of this macrophage. And so this has um, actin arranged in a very specific orientation. Okay, so here's a little bit more detail on how this would help a cell move forward. So again, we're looking at kind of a um, cartoon macrophage in this case. So throughout the cell, actin contributes to our cell cortex, that um, arrangement of proteins that help out maintaining our cell shape. And then at the very edge here, we have this structure called the lamellipodium. Other proteins help the cell anchor to some kind of substrate. And we want to move the cell forward. And the way we do that is that we'll have a lot of actin polymerizing all at once in one direction. So we're adding um, actin monomers all this way, which is going to protrude the cell membrane forward. So as we're moving this membrane forward, it's going to put some tension on the rest of the cell. And in order to maintain um, its shape, we have some other motor proteins on this end of the cell that will help contract. So it's this coupling of extension and contraction uh, mediated by actin molecules. 
that will help move the cell along. There's also proteins that will then kind of anchor the cell to the substrate. They're called integrins. Once we've made another contact over here, we're able to continually move the cell forward. Myosin and actin will help contract, and it furthers the cell. All right, so if you want more information, more background information on different kinds of cells that move around and how scientists study them, I highly recommend this article by Carl Zimmer. If you're looking for extra things to read, by no means is it required. Um, but it's a really wonderful article looking at how we can study the movement of these different cells. Okay, and if we, I'll go back one more slide. So if we kind of looked at this leading edge and zoomed in on what the actin were doing, that's the subject of this next slide. So in here, we're looking at um, the leading edge of the cell. So this was the very edge that was moving our cell forward. And all of these red and pink actin molecules down here are in different phases of um, growth and dissociation. So the reason we're able to move this edge ahead is because we're building up a lot of actin in one direction. And so we're able to do that um, with the assistance of a couple different proteins. So these brown, almost little Pac-Man structures are called um, the actin-related protein complex, or ARP complex. And just like the gamma tubulin with microtubules, it anchors the actin in place and helps it just grow in one direction. So these ARP little Pac-Man structures grab onto an actin, and then it's able to add actin monomers out here, and that is what will push the uh, membrane forward. And so after it's moved ahead far enough, we have all of these actin filaments down here we can start breaking them down to contribute more toward the leading edge. And so if we don't want them to, to be broken down at the very beginning, we can cap them with this little protein um, labeled in blue called a capping protein. So we, we've built up our actin molecule. We don't want it to degrade, so we add this little cap protein. And then we can continue kind of building actin forward once we get far enough away, we're able to start this process of um, depolymerization. Um, so we can remove those cat proteins, we can remove those ARP complexes, degrade, get those actin monomers available to keep building up toward the leading edge. All right, so that's the mechanism for how uh, actin can help move cells forward. Now we're going to transition to looking at that, that other interaction, actin and myosin. So myosin uh, is another kind of motor protein. And so there's a few different flavors. We're only going to talk about two today, um, but they're pretty important. So myosin 1 is so named because there's one head domain and one tail structure. So myosin 1 helps move vesicles and other things, the, the heads are going to interact with the actin molecules, and the tails will then interact with a vesicle or some other kind of um, structure. So myosin 1 is always going to move um, toward the positive end. So when it's moving a vesicle here, it's moving toward the positive end or the barbed end of our actin. And that's what brings this vesicle forward. Myosin can also be anchored to something else, and it's going to move toward the positive end, which can then move the actin this way. All right, so myosin is unidirectional, just like dynein and kinesin. And we'll see another flavor of myosin. So the interactions between myosin and actin are really important for our muscle function. So apologies if you guys have seen this in A and P. This might be a helpful review. Um, but when we're thinking about movement, right, muscles are one of the biggest ways that human beings are able to move around. And if we start um, looking at the different components of muscle, eventually we get down to the smallest unit of contraction, which is our sarcomere right here. 
So I'll start up here. We have our muscle tissue. Each one of those is composed of muscle fibers. These are cool cells that have fused together to make these really big, long, multinucleated cells um, composed of individual myofibrils. And then if we break that down even further, it's made up of these individual sarcomeres. Okay, so what is a sarcomere? Well, um, it is this complex of thin filaments or actin filaments so in blue in this drawing. Those are anchored to this portion right here. So these dark blue lines segment off one sarcomere from the other. And in the middle, we have these thick filaments, so named because that's what they look like under the microscope. These are composed of uh, myosin 2. So the previous slide, we saw myosin 1. These bundles, these fibers, are um, complexes of myosin 2. And so these are going to act in concert to contribute to muscle contraction. So zooming in on the sarcomere then, we're able to see all of these different structures. So um, the previous diagram, these were thick blue lines, and this, they're green, but they are the Z disc. So these are these dark lines right here. These are the boundaries of each individual sarcomere. And so these are important because that's where the actin is anchored. So we have the barbed end anchored to the Z disc. And our pointed end over here. And then our myosin molecules are attached to each other. They also have a similar structure to myosin 1, except there's um, two heads per molecule. And so the head regions here are these almost like leaf-like structures. And then this H zone is the tail region of these myosin proteins. And so myosin is going to pull actin, or it's going to interact in one certain direction. And because we have the, the positive or barbed ends here, myosin is going to travel that way. At the same time, this end is also going to travel that way. And so in response to certain signals, they all in concert contract at the same time. And so here's a better uh, image of that transition. So again, the M line is the, the middle of where the myosin is. It's going to move toward the positive or barbed end of the actin. And it's doing that kind of on this mirror image. And so at the same time, the myosin is going to move toward the Z disc on either side and pull these um, actin filaments closer together. And this process is modulated by ATP. So one of the big reasons why when you're working out or when muscles are moving a lot, we need a lot of energy. It's this um, in the form of ATP to facilitate muscle contraction. And so in a nutshell, that process um, is going to start here. So we have our myosin head bound. We add ATP. It's going to take that myosin head off the actin. Uh, once that um, ATP is hydro hydrolyzed, it causes that movement um, of myosin head to, of the myosin head to come off. And then once that ADP and phosphate has left, then that myosin head can connect to a new actin monomer. So this constant hydro hydrolyzation of ATP is what allows the myosin heads to dissociate and then attach a little farther along. Come off, come back. Come off, come back. But it's not just actin and myosin that are uh, working together. Another couple molecules that control this process are tropomyosin and troponin. And so tropomyosin are these red, almost licorice type rope molecules. They're always surrounding these actin filaments. So these are, again, associated along the entire length of the filament. There's also troponin complexes that are along on different areas of the actin molecules. 
And so these will act in a certain way depending on whether or not calcium is present. So we saw how we can release calcium um, in our signaling lecture, and this is a specific case of calcium signaling. So these molecules are able to use tropomyosin and troponins determine whether or not myosin can bind actin in the first place. So when there's no calcium in the cell, again, there's very, very, very small amounts, amounts in the cytosol. It's mostly stored in the ER or other places. So without calcium around, myosin is unable to bind to actin. So your muscles are, are not going to contract. However, due to some kind of signal, um, something like we discussed last week, Calcium is released. It's able to bind different signaling molecules. And in this case, if it binds um, our, tropo, our troponin complex, it's able to shift those tropomyosin. So I'll go back to the previous slide. So once calcium binds the troponin complex, it shifts these red rope-like structures. It shifts the tropomyosin enough that makes um, sites available for myosin to bind. So without calcium, the tropomyosin prevents myosin from binding. With calcium, the tropomyosin shifts a little bit, and that allows myosin to bind to those actin monomers. OK, so we can see here no calcium. Tropomyosin is blocking myosin. When we add calcium, it create that conformational change. It moves tropomyosin so that myosin is able to bind actin. And in muscle cells, there's a specific kind of endoplasmic reticulum called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So I'm not going to go into the details of the anatomy of this. All um, I care about for this class is that we know these T tubules. This is what's going to receive the incoming electrical signal. It's going to pass through these T-tubules, and it's going to pass that message on to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is surrounding um, these different myofibrils right here. So this is where that calcium is concentrated. So there's tons of pumps that keep that gradient really high. So the calcium concentration is very high in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and very low in the cytosol. But once that T tubule senses that incoming electrical signal, it's going to go through. It's going to signal the sarcoplasmic reticulum then to release a lot of calcium. And that's what triggers that muscle contraction. And so here's a kind of close up view. So these nerve cells right, are interacting with the T tubules. The signal can go through. And this signals the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium and get that process of muscle contraction started. OK, so how does that work? Well, the calcium is going to be released. Again, it's a transient signal, so it's going to go through really quickly and then be pumped right back in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, one kind of protein that calcium interacts with is calmodulin. So we saw this um, the last lecture or so. Calcium comes in and binds the inactive calmodulin. These calcium ions are then able to change the shape of calmodulin in a pretty dramatic way. And what this calmodulin protein binds to is something called the MLCK, or the myosin light chain kinase. And so when, the, when this MLCK is inactive, it's kind of wrapped around each other. It has this protruding calmodulin binding site. So this active calmodulin then is able to come in and wrap itself around the binding site. This releases the active site of this, of this kinase. And kinases, hopefully you remember, are able to phosphorylate proteins. And so this active kinase interacts with myosin 2. And myosin 2, when it's inactive, it has these light chains kind of right by the head and these heavy chains 
that we saw on our six filaments. When myosin is inactive, they just kind of wrap around each other. But when it's active, when, when the MLCK phosphorylates these light chains, then those heavy chains straighten out and become active. Okay, so one more from the top. Calcium comes in due to that electrical signal through the T-tubule to the sarcoplasmic retic reticulum, releases calcium. Calcium binds calmodulin. Calcium-bound calmodulin is able to activate this kinase. This active kinase comes in, and with the use of ATP, phosphorylates inactive myosin. And the active myosin then can contribute to muscle contraction and muscle movement. Okay, so muscle movement was a very specific case of motility with actin molecules, um, and that wraps up our discussion of the cytoskeleton. So just to wrap up what we talked about today, there are three main kinds of filaments or proteins, um, not including all of the different proteins that interact with them that make up the cytoskeleton. So that was microtubules, intermediate filaments, and microfilaments or actin filaments. All of these together make up the cytoskeleton, which provides structure and allow movement not only within the cell, but also movement um, with the cell as a whole. And these aren't made and then left. These structures are all dynamic. They're changing all of the time and regulated in different ways to help with their function. All right, so that was a lot of different proteins, um, different information, but it's really helpful to understand how the cell is given structure, what that means for cell movement, um, so we can start filling in what's not drawn in those diagrams. All right, so a quiz will come up for this lecture shortly, and again, a lot more information on what's coming up very soon. I hope you guys are staying well. Uh, my, daily, my weekly miss having you guys in class, um, but it's true. Let me know as things come up what's going on.